This is K.M. Wyland, and you're listening to the 75th episode of the Wordplay Podcast. Outlines are lovely things. I'd be lost without my roadmap to show me the safe path through the chaos of my story worlds. But the one place where my outlines almost always prove fallible is in the final chapters. The order of scenes, the choreography of character movements that I thought was going to happen in a particular way, always manages to look completely different from a distance than it does by the time I get up close. Right now I'm standing on the brink of the climax in my work in progress, The Deepest Breath, and realizing, once again, that my outline is going to need some restructuring to accommodate the demands of the characters. This week I'm taking a break from writing and going back to read what I've written so far, so that I can orientate myself in the story and move forward with a clear sense of what lays behind. Internal and External Conflict, The Killer Combination The latest post in the video series on my blog shows how to use the two sides of conflict to bring your stories to a stunning conclusion. You can watch the video on my blog at wordplay-kmyland, that's w-e-i-l-a-n-d dot blogspot dot com. New videos are posted every Wednesday. Meanwhile, enjoy this week's podcast. Description. Friend or foe? Nothing bores me faster than description. You've probably heard readers make that comment. Perhaps you've even made it yourself. In the face of the modern impatience with pages, or even paragraphs, of descriptive narrative, it's easy for writers to overreact and decide to avoid description altogether. After all, we can't afford to do anything that might alienate readers. But today I'm here to offer a shocking declaration. Description gets a bad rap. Walk back into the homey corridors of the library in your head and pull a couple favorites off the shelf. Think about the scenes that pop to mind, the ones you can still recall in vivid detail, even years after reading them. Likely most, if not all, of these scenes include some magnificent spark of description that has anchored them in your brain. I can still see the film on the water as the main character in J.G. Ballard's Empire of the Sun drinks downstream from a Japanese soldier's corpse. I can see Sarah Crewe's too small black morning dress as she faces Miss Minchin after learning of her father's death in The Little Princess by Frances Hodgson Burnett. And I can clearly see the magnificent reflected sunset in The Pulitzer Winning Gilead by Marilyn Robinson. These scenes have remained with me over the years, not because they raced past the description to get to the good stuff, but because the authors offered such a deft weave of descriptive detail into the very fiber of their story's plot and character. These visual images are forever emblazoned in my brain. What author doesn't want that kind of immortality? Description is one of the most powerful and beautiful tools in the author's arsenal. In fact, in some respects, description is the foundation of writing. What is a story if not a description of the world around us, the people who inhabit it, and their feelings as they interact with it? Avoiding description is impossible, and attempting to avoid it does nothing but tie an author's hands. Rather, what we need to do is learn how to use it effectively. However, in our pursuit of effective description, it's important to remember that less is often more, and telling details always carry the day. Brett Anthony Johnston writes in Naming the World that the most affecting descriptive writing results from an author's providing not a linguistic blueprint of a library, but the raw material, the air tinged with the scent of old pages, the shafts of dusty light through the window slats, the whispers, like trickling water, of the librarians behind the oval reference desk, from which the reader can erect her own library. Description must flow organically from the narrating character, his lifestyle, and his voice. Beautiful prose is useless if it distracts from or obstructs the point of a passage. Too often authors use description, not as a servant of the story, but as a platform from which to flaunt their sometimes arguable mastery of language. When that happens, it's little wonder description bores and angers readers. Quinn Dalton, in the writer, December 2010 article, Five Ways into a Story, sums up nicely. There may be an impulse to describe everything, whether it has significance to the main character or not. It might be hard to simply say a lamp on a small table, because you want the reader to see the Queen Anne table that you see. But it has to matter to the character for you to go further. He or she should reasonably be able to identify the table as a Queen Anne. If not, you've let your desire for detail overwhelm that character's knowledge and priorities. 
Thank you for listening to the Wordplay podcast. To read a transcript of this episode, visit me on the web at wordplay-kmyland, that's W-E-I-L-A-N-D, dot blogspot.com, and be sure to listen again next week. Mm-hmm.